Um, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for being here. Today we are joined by author, comedian, television and radio presenter, Viv Groskop. Viv is the host of the massively popular podcast, How to Own the Room, and author of the two best-selling books, How to Own the Room and Lift as You Climb. In today's live stream, Viv will draw on her executive coach expertise to provide insights and tips to the unique difficulties of working during this challenging time. Welcome, Viv. Yay! I will applaud solely myself, all on my own. Hi, thank you so much uh, for tuning in. Thank you for turning up, making space in your day or whatever seems like your day, who knows what a day is anymore. Um, and welcome to How to Cope with Uncertainty at Work. I hope you have a glass of something in hand. I have tea for now, but I'm gonna be having a glass um, of wine as soon as we finish this. And I'm just really thrilled uh, that you've taken the time to do this and thank you for turning up. Um, as Dana says, I want to run this uh, hour that we have together as interactive as possible. So please use this as an excuse to fiddle around with all the bits of Zoom that you've been too embarrassed to try when you're on a work call. Um, ask questions, leave comments, tell us a bit about yourself if you feel like it be anonymous if you want to I think that this is a really difficult time to show up and pretend to be some kind of expert in anything I've recently been noticing newspapers running articles that say things like studies show productivity really increases when you're working from home and it drives me crazy because I just think studies from when studies from before there are no studies whatsoever that can tell us how to work during a pandemic. There's no person who can tell us how to work really well during this time. So anyone who's trying to tell you that they've nailed it or they've got the answer or they really know how to make the most of this time, um, they're talking out of their ass, basically. So I wanted to use this as a forum for us to brainstorm some ideas, but most of all, I wanted to use it as a place to feel reassured, motivated and inspired. So I want to set an intention for this hour that we've got together and that is inspired by Maya Angelou. And I was using this quote in lots of events that I was doing, which now have of course been cancelled. Virtually my whole life has been cancelled for the next three years basically. Uh, I was using this quote a lot in events uh, before all this happened and it's this quote from Maya Angelou. People will never remember what you say. People will never remember what you do, but they will always remember how you made them feel. And I feel as if this is an incredibly useful way of thinking about the present moment. It doesn't matter so much what we do and what our actions are. It doesn't so, ma so much matter what our content is that we're putting out or the words that we're using to communicate with each other. But it really matters how we make other people feel. So I wanted to try and find a forum where we can talk about work and talk about how we can make each other feel better, feel more inspired and feel lifted. Uh, because one thing I have been fi finding really difficult in recent times is being very focused on myself and being very introspective during this time, particularly because we're not able to go out and about and interact with our usual work colleagues. We're not able to do all of those things that usually distract us and motivate us. And for me personally, it really pushes me in on myself. It makes me question a lot of things about myself. And I found that the only thing that really helps me to lift out of that is think, well, what can I do for somebody else? How can I make someone else feel better? If I don't really know how to make myself feel better right now, can I at least do something for someone else to make them feel better? And I think in a work context, that works really well. It means you can find ways of reaching out to clients, to colleagues, uh, to people you used to work with who you haven't thought about for ages, uh, to brainstorm what's going on, to reassure yourself that they're going through the same difficulties you are, to maybe find out they've thought of things that you haven't thought of. So just that idea of think about how you can make other people feel better as advised by Maya Angelou, and there is no one better to advise. I wanted to start as well by uh, mentioning something personal, which I normally wouldn't do at an event at all, but I want to acknowledge how weird this situation is. 
And of course, I'm speaking to you from home. I'm speaking to you from my bedroom, which I'm not going to turn this around and show you my bedroom because it's really embarrassing. I have three unsupervised children in the home. And for me, this is a sort of perfect manifestation of how uncertain and weird this time is. This day, which has been in my calendar for a while since this started and we moved a How To Academy live event online, I've known that I was going to be doing this tonight. What I couldn't know was that I would have no childcare because I didn't know that my husband would be going into work today. My husband has been off work, um, wait, working from home. What am I saying off work? You see, this is where this whole uncertainty thing comes in. He's been working from home for the last six weeks. He hasn't been into work for six weeks. But today of all days, he was called into work. And it's not because he's lifted his lockdown or anything like that. He has a very specific, important reason for going into work. So he hasn't been here for the day and uh, my children are in the house and I hope we're not going to interrupt this. And about half an hour before this call started and I was doing all these warnings of don't come in whilst I'm doing my call and are you all going to be okay and here's full access to a cupboard full of food that nobody should really eat at all but just eat as much of it as you want. Uh, and then my daughter smashed a plate and I was trying to get finished up, have everything ready for this call. And I realized that, no, I need to stop what I'm doing, clear up all these shards of broken crockery because we have a cat walking around who's going to get an injury in their paw and I don't want to have to go to the vet because then I have to worry about cat coronavirus vet. And I just thought, you know, this is something that is completely unpredictable in a work situation and everyone everywhere is dealing with this weirdness. And I think the feeling for a lot of us is that the situation is very hard for us to process because it's extremely serious and extremely trivial at the same time. So we feel caught between these two extremes of, I need to take the situation really seriously. There are lots of difficulties going on with work that are unpredictable. I need to support other people I work with. I need to be mindful of all the frontline workers who are sacrificing sometimes their lives to deal with this, of all the many pe thousands of people who are dying from this. But at the same time, we are all, many of us, fortunate enough to be at home and be safe and for the biggest problem that we have to be that we have a work call but one of our children just has just smashed a plate and the cat is going to put his paws in it so we're really sort of moving between these sort of crazy extremes that are really hard for us to process and i realized when my husband left for work this morning that the feeling it reminded me of was the feeling you have uh, when you first have a baby and your partner, if you're lucky enough to have a partner and you're not raising a child alone, uh, and your partner goes back to work for the first time after you know the regulation two weeks, rubbish two weeks paternity leave. And as they go off, you think, sorry, where are you going? Because I can't look after a baby on my own. I'm not qualified for this. Part of you is thinking that and you're in total panic. And then another part of you is thinking, well, what am I talking about? Like people look after babies all the time. I can figure this out. This is fine. And it occurred to me that this is exactly the cognitive dissonance that we're facing, that we realize we're in an everyday situation that people face all of the time, which is managing a crisis, being safe at home, getting on with our lives. But on the other hand, the other side of it is panic, chaos, thinking, I have absolutely no qualifications whatsoever for dealing with this moment. None of us have any qualifications for dealing with this moment and knowing what's going to be coming. So for me, it's all about learning to sit in the middle of those two things between I'm, complete, I'm completely un unqualified. I can't even say it. I'm completely unqualified and it's okay. I can handle this. People are handling this everywhere. So really sitting between those two things. Mindful of the three small, they're not that small actually, my kids are 9, 13 and 16, uh, the three small-ish people who could uh, break into this room at any moment. Um, and seeing as I don't believe there are any experts on this idea of uncertainty at work, I thought I would ask their opinions uh, when I was preparing uh, what to say today. So I said to my eldest son, um, who's 16, I'm going to be talking about how to cope with uncertainty at work. What do you think people 
would want to know about this? What advice would you give? And he said, you should tell them just to get on with it. It's not like it's difficult to stay at home. And I said, well, you know, well, it's quite hard for people because maybe they've never worked from home before. They don't know what's come, coming on the other side of this. They're struggling to deal with these new technologies. It's, it's difficult for people. What advice would you have if people are struggling with those things? And he said, uh, those people should get a hold of themselves and try harder. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's my son, basically. Uh, my daughter, who's 13, is a little bit more uh, Oprah. And her advice is be realistic, but also be hopeful, which I think is great advice. And I said, what exactly does that mean? What can people do to be realistic and be hopeful at the same time? And she said, do something small that is achievable, like cleaning the kitchen. It's a very hypocritical piece of advice from her. Talk to other people in the same situation exactly what we're doing now and don't sit in your bed all day and I said are you saying that to me because there are some days when I've done that and she said well you're not in your bed right now but you were naked an hour ago um, that was at about three o'clock now last but not least I asked Jack who's nine and I said you know I'm talking to people about how to cope with uncertainty at work what's your advice and he said you probably shouldn't be asking me about this this is the sort of thing you should know about but I will say this, just because you can't be together now, it doesn't mean you never will, which I thought was great. Before we kick off with questions, oh, hit in my hearing there, sorry. JLo, look, people approve, right? Okay, before we kick off with all of your questions, I'm going to give three really easy to remember pieces of advice that are inspired um, by my daughter, Vera, who, gave this uh, advice of be realistic. So in this place of uncertainty at work, what does being realistic look like? And I've put this as uh, something that I hope people can remember. And I'm also gonna put it on my Instagram afterwards. So don't feel like you have to write this down because I'll write it down there for you. I'll put it on Twitter as well. It's basically an ABC idea. A is acknowledge loss and I'll explain them all in a minute. B is be careful of your thoughts. And C is cultivate community. So acknowledge loss, be careful of your thoughts and cultivate community. Acknowledging loss, I think, is one of the most important parts of this. And it's maybe, I'd, from conversations that I've had with people over the last few weeks, connected to all different kinds of work, I think it's one of the parts of work that has been most difficult for us to talk about because a lot of the conversation around loss is around loss of life. It, it's around very serious, difficult issues. And it becomes much more difficult to talk about the loss of business or the loss of opportunities. And sometimes I think we can almost try to sweep these things under the carpet because we feel a bit embarrassed that, you know, I've had this myself that I feel, you know, what is the any loss that I might experience in my working life over the next six months to a year, even if it's completely wiped out, which it may well be. Um, what is it compared to what many, many tens of thousands of people around the world are going through? It's absolutely nothing. You know, if you have a roof over your head and money in the bank and food in your fridge and everyone around you is safe, it, your loss is nothing. So I, I think that's the tendency that we have to think um, and I think it's great and it's right to think that and it's natural and normal but I also think it's important on some to some degree to enumerate what the losses are in your business life in your work life and be honest with the, about, with yourself about them and mourn them it's only when you enumerate them think about them mourn it allow yourself to have that moment of grief however trivial you may feel that it is it's real you know there's no hierarchy of loss here everyone has lost things so being honest with yourself and with your colleagues and with your family about what's lost and how you feel sad and disappointed about that uh, maybe even you feel a bit broken about that 
uh, you have to allow that moment to happen. Otherwise you can't move on and find the next part. And I can see quite a lot of people at the moment kind of stuck uh, of not wanting to acknowledge loss because it's too scary. But we really need to face up to that and acknowledge your loss even, even if it feels like a small loss in comparison to the losses of others. Be careful of your thoughts. Now, be careful of your thoughts is the most important thing. Uh, anyone who already works from home from before this, uh, anyone who's freelance, who's an entrepreneur, a creative will already know that the watchword for anybody working in unpredictable or uncertain circumstances, which is what is all creative endeavor, all entrepreneur, all entrepreneurs, all manage of, a, man a manner of freelancing, it's all around managing your morale. And your morale is all about your mindset, what you're doing to look after yourself, what people now call self-care, which is you know, easy to write that off as, as being also trivial, but I, these things are incredibly important now. It's that whole thing of if you don't put on your own oxygen mask first, then you can't help other people. This is a big message in my book, Lift As You Climb, is that you cannot lift others if you're not in a good place yourself. So the first person you have to be generous towards is yourself. Give yourself what you need, make an inventory constantly of how you're feeling, check in with your emotions, make sure that if you're feeling resentful about something, you do something about it. There's all kinds of advice floating around about this. Um, I'm skeptical about some of it because I believe that a lot of it is based on the pre-pandemic scenario so all this stuff about make a schedule uh, make sure you've got a delineated working space in your home keep working hours you know all of these things i don't think they're wrong but i'm not sure how practical they are for everybody at the moment so if you can stick to those things and find something in them that works for you whether it's you know doing the pomodoro technique where you do 20 minutes of work and then a five minute break or you have two hours at the beginning of the day when you work or two hours at the end, or you only have one time in the day when you check your emails. All of those things are really practical. But remember that a lot of those pieces of practical advice and those takeaways come from the pre-pandemic. And I feel as if what we're all going to have to do now is pull together and find new ways of working around these gaps and not being unrealistic about things because for some people it's just not possible to have this kind of working structure that we might have ideally. So be careful of your thoughts is all to do with giving yourself mental space and making sure that you are managing your morale. Cultivate community. We're doing that right now um, and I'm going to dive into questions in a second. Cultivating community for me at the moment is about reaching out to people who you were already in touch with just before all this happened, but also about reaching back. This is a great time to check in with people you haven't thought about for ages. It's also a great time to look at the much wider community, perhaps with other people in your industry or people you admire in different fields. This is a great time to reach out to people who you wouldn't necessarily reach out to because this is a time when we all need to connect, when we all need to feel that other people are thinking of us. And even really tiny things can help now. You know, I'm noticing so many writers and artists uh, on social media just feeling so supportive by anyone who posts something about their book or their piece of art or their poem or their tweet. Uh, it, people want to feel seen and heard more than ever so if you can do that for anyone that is a fantastic uh, contribution to make that cultivation of community and doing it within however small a circle you want or however big a circle you want whatever you can do uh, makes it feel feel meaningful and as I suggested at the beginning as well it's a great way of getting out of your own head getting out of those circular ideas and thoughts that we have of, oh what's coming next and really important part of living in the here and now and just dealing with today we might not be able to think about where are we going to be in six months time is this still going to be happening at Christmas time how am I going to plan for 2021 don't be thinking of that be thinking what can I do today to cultivate community and it will give you a sense of peace a sense of control and a sense of having contributed something 
that is actually a brilliant kind of selfish act to do for yourself, but it's what I call altruistic ambition. So it's the kind of ambition that allows you to reach out and make progress, do something for someone else, but also it has that selfish benefit of like, I feel good because I've helped someone else. So anything that ticks this box of altruistic ambition where you move forward, you do something, um, but you do it reaching out to other people is incredibly useful. So, ABC, acknowledge loss, be careful of your thoughts, cultivate community. Um, I'm going to come to Dana for questions, and I, I'm sure there are lots of questions, but just in case there aren't, um, I was thinking uh, anything you want to talk about, like how to manage these te technologies. I'm trying to become the how to own the Zoom person. Uh, that's really hard. This is a very difficult technology. Very happy to talk about that. Concentration span, homeschooling, whether you're on a job hunt, whether you're on furlough. If you're on furlough, serious kudos for tuning into this. Like, why aren't you just rain bathing or sunbathing? Uh, anything about entrepreneurship, creativity, bring it on. Over to you, Dana. Awesome. Thanks, Viv. Um, we actually do have a lot of questions coming in. Great. Uh, People are loving your JLo look, by the way. Um, and the first question is from Harriet. And she asks, is anyone else fed up of feeling they have to connect with everyone? Is all this tech creating pressure? Love it. Um, yeah. Sarah asks, I have stepped up into a new role during lockdown and have gone from managing one person to managing five. I find I'm using a lot of energy to support them and make sure they're okay, that behind the scenes, I'm not looking after myself, only going out of the flat for a walk every two to three days, working long hours, not sleeping. How can I reset and balance this? Amazing. Okay, one more. Um, what is, what's your take on the fact that, sorry, from Jane, what's your take on the fact that there's potentially comfort in the fact that everyone else is going through this at the same time with us? Does it bring us closer in some way that we've not been before nationally and globally? Love it. Okay, yeah, one more. Okay. Um, from, this is from an anonymous attendee. Um, at the moment, while the majority of the population are in lockdown, there's a degree of consensus in terms of what we all need to do. But when the lockdown starts to unwind, individual actions and competing interests will come back into play. This will bring a different and potentially worse kind of uncertainty. What are your thoughts about dealing with this situation post-lockdown? Okay, I love that. I love that. Massively cynical pessimist after my own heart. Well done, anonymous. I, I, I don't know if this is true. I'm going to kick off with that, actually. We don't know if that's true. There's a lot of things, you may well be right, Anonymous, I'm not suggesting that you're wrong. And I do think a lot of people's anxiety and uncertainty now is centered around, okay, I've been at home for three, four, five, six weeks. I've kind of got used to this new normal. I hate the expression new normal. Um, but what's coming next? What's coming next? And everybody, you know how at the beginning of all of this, or at least this is what I was doing, you're just constantly surfing the net, looking for who's ahead of you. So uh, in the beginning of March, me being in London, I was constantly trying to read everything from Italy to see what's coming next. And now we're doing it again about the exiting the lockdown. So I'm reading everything that's coming out of Germany, France, trying to see, okay, where is this going? And I'm not, how sh I'm not sure how useful this is. I think when we look back on all of this, it's gonna look very different to how it looks in the present moment. Our brains always want to try and make sense of everything and take control. And I think this is a time to get very controlled about the minutiae in your life. So um, I'm gonna to come to Sarah's question um, to tie in with this here, who's talking about stepping up from managing one person to five, only going out every two to three days, how can she reset? And this ties in with Anonymous, you know, what do we do next when things start to open up and people are going to be following different rules to each other? Uh, we're gonna be following different rules in different parts of the country. We're gonna be following different rules internationally. And yeah, there could be tension there. So the way to control it, and this is for you, Sarah, uh, 
control what you can control in your life. So find some elements that give you comfort. Absolutely find a way to put yourself first, even if it's only for half an hour a day. So this is the time to do all of those woo woo things that you've always thought are really embarrassing. And please just say, I'm doing this because Viv made me. So this is a time to create a meditation corner in your house. I'm sorry, but it is. It's the time to buy yourself flowers. I know this is really tragic, right? I went online and I ordered flowers for myself. I would not normally do this. Um, I did it partly to like support the florist industry. Um, this is the time to do things for yourself. Um, however small, however pathetic. I also bought this from Marks and Spencers because I don't want Marks and Spencers to close down. So this is a time to find things and really find them by drilling into who you are as a human being, as a quirky individual. Control the minutiae, control the stuff that you love. This is what uh, I'm sure lots of people watching uh, know the brilliant writer Gretchen Rubin, the author of The Happiness Project and Better Than Before. And her number one uh, tip on her list of being happier, she calls it Be More Gretchen. So for me, it's Be More Viv. For you, Sarah, be more Sarah. For Anonymous, be more anonymous. It's about finding the thing that only you really care about that makes you feel really, really great. So for me, it's like, I really want to order some peonies to make sure I have some peonies. Um, other people might be like, that's just embarrassing, that's rubbish. What I really want is to have the perfect Buddha in my meditation corner. Um, don't feel selfish and don't feel trivial about having those things because if you can have that thing and it is like a demarcation. So you could have a demarcation of space, like um, one shelf in your home that is like a little shrine to everything that you love and is always really ordered and perfect. And that every just and you can just spend a few moments looking at that, controlling that and having that be more you element if you can have that focus for 20 minutes, half an hour a day, giving back to yourself, that is how you're going to be able to be more generous to those other people that you have to serve. If you keep giving, 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 checking in with these other five colleagues, managing this new job, you are going to burn out. So it is a service to them to do something for yourself. So this idea of altruistic ambition, the idea of lifting as you climb, you absolutely have to do it from the place of having a full tank. So if you feel like, oh, you know what, my tank is running on empty here, you need to intervene. You need to do something to look after yourself. And this takes a level of sometimes discipline. So sometimes you have to take yourself in hand and be like, do you know what? I've drunk seven nights this week. I'm not going to pretend that I'm going to give up drinking, but this week I'm only going to drink three nights or, you know, I'm not going to have half a bottle of wine. I'm going to have one glass of wine, setting yourself limits, discipline within reason whilst being kind to yourself. That's the key. Uh, Harriet on the tech pressure. I couldn't agree with you more. I haven't encountered anyone of the many people I interact with or don't interact with nearly as not, uh, as many people as I'd like to, like I do in normal life. I'm, you know, extrovert and hate, hate this lockdown nonsense. Uh, although obviously I think it is the absolute right thing to do. Um, but yeah, I haven't heard from anybody that they find this, um, uh, I think maybe some introverts um, are, are being nourished uh, during this time and uh, they're glad of, of the kind of peace and quiet but in terms of the tech pressure and this constant kind of oh we're having a meeting on zoom and we're doing a quiz and now we're doing a disco and now we're doing a cocktail and now we're doing a being silent on zoom and working alongside each other what um yeah this is all about finding balance and boundaries and working out what works for you and just being honest with yourself um, I turned down a lot of Zoom stuff because I find it exhausting and wearing. Um, I feel like the energy and, and these great questions, I can kind of feel people out there whilst I'm doing this. But generally speaking, I find it 
very difficult and again what I said before about we don't have studies there aren't there are some studies uh, from academia and from psycho uh, psychotherapy about the effect of zoom on interactions and on relationships they're quite small scale studies and obviously they're pre-pandemic as well so they wouldn't tell you about how people are managing now but from everything that I'm hearing from people anecdotally people do find it uh, wearing and exhausting. So respect your boundaries. I think there's a lot to be said for making sure that you really need to be in a meeting if you really do, and maybe saying to your boss, um, you know, I'm actually gonna do some extra work just on my own today, I'm not gonna be on that call. Um, or, you know, could you send me a, a message after the call if there's anything that I need to know, and um, managing your time that way. Uh, or even I was on a call uh, last week, there were 10 of us and I think three or four of us had said it was uh, for an hour and a half and three or four of us had said, actually, we need to do a hard stop at an hour. And because three out of 10 had said that, the whole thing had a hard stop at 45 minutes and it was ideal. So I think uh, for us to get the most out of this technology, which is again, what I try to be careful, I don't know if I've got the balance right, I'm still finding my way through all of this. Um, we need to get the balance right in terms of how much time we spend on this um, because it's very draining for our concentration span. So for example, I try to talk at the beginning at the top for maximum 20 minutes and I'm also trying to vary my tone and move around and do different things uh, because to be spoken at on this technology is exhausting for you and for me. So remembering to switch it up uh, is really important. And remembering that people's natural attention span is 20 minutes. So I would usually go to questions in an event of 20 minutes. So I'm always gonna do that on Zoom. So yeah, Harriet, we feel your pain. You're right. Uh, what did Jane's, oh yeah. Are we, Jane asked, are we getting comfort? Uh, are we getting some comfort from the solidarity that we can feel by, uh, I don't want to say that cliched phrase, all being in this together, um, because a lot of this has pointed out that uh, we're not all this in this together. And in fact, it shows up inequality in many, many ways. But yes, Jane, I think you're right. I think this is one great way of getting through this is finding new ways to be honest, sincere, authentic in our communications with each other and say, like, I'm not coping, I'm hating this, or I'm just calling you because I'm bored or I'm just calling you because I'm having a bad day. Really, really drilling down and being honest with people about how we're feeling about things. I think that's where we get the solidarity from. And not second guessing other people, I think is really important in this moment. Um, I, felt, I felt really quite lonely in the early days of this, although I'm really lucky that I'm at home with, with my family. Um, but I was really missing my friends and my work colleagues and really missing life. And I noticed that a lot of friends who I thought would reach out to me didn't. And later, and I reached out to them and eventually we spoke. And after a while, a few people said the same thing to me, was, which was that they were kind of scared to speak to me because they thought that I would be, in inverted commas, bossing it. I hate that expression. That I would be like, oh yeah, I'm having a great time in lockdown. I've already made, you know, 56 vegan lasagnas. They're in the freezer and I've written two novels. And... In fact, I was, you know, a, a mess. I was just a complete mess for about the, th the first three weeks thinking, where has my life gone? What am I gonna do? Uh, and feeling very selfish uh, for thinking that and then feeling even worse. So I absolutely wasn't bossing it. So don't be, uh, don't assume anything about what anyone else is going through. Um, reach out, ask, let's be honest with each other. So yeah, Dana, let's let's hear some more questions. Great. Um, so we've had so many more come in. Um, Stephen asks, what are your tips for overcoming procrastination? <laughs> okay, good one. Uh, Katie asks, I'm due to start a new job in the next few weeks, which will likely start from home. Any advice on how to integrate or highlight myself in the best way? Oh my God, that's a great question. That's a really hard question. Okay, go more. Um, from Anonymous, how do you navigate working from home full-time alongside a partner who has lost all their work and act sensitively towards juggling this dynamic and their loss of self-worth and identity? 
Oh my God, heavy. Okay. Okay. Um, and then one more from Sarah. How do you practice empathy with people who are, who you are managing, who have checked out? How do you hold them accountable? How do you bring grace into that, but also structure? Great. Let's have a couple more. Okay. Um, from Nalina, how do we make our bosses understand that we need regularity and fixed working hours in order to not burn out? Okay. Mean boss question. Okay. One more. R from Rose. Um, she's an entrepreneur and a creative that had to stop working with all of this. She feels completely lost and torn apart. Any thoughts on managing personal space? Managing personal space. Personal space. I'm feeling lost. Oh, okay. Wow. Well, that's a great, uh, those questions are fantastic. Great measure of how lots of uh, people are feeling. Thank you so much for taking the time to voice all of those thoughts. Um, uh, please do keep questions coming and we'll just get through as many as we possibly can. Uh, and anything you want to pull me up on or you feel like I didn't give a great answer or whatever, just pull me up and let, let me know. I want this to be as useful to people as possible. Uh, Stephen, how to overcome procrastination. I guess I should know a lot about this as a writer. My advice, and, and this is advice I often give about writer's block, is start somewhere, start anywhere. You know, my daughter said at the beginning, achieve something small. So procrastination is usually about us wanting to see too far ahead into the future. We want to imagine what the task is going to be like when it's finished. We don't have to go there. We only have to go here. So do something, do anything and be prepared for the thing to be the wrong thing because then at least you've got something to undo. There was a writer who was uh, tweeting about writer's block today. Uh, if you uh, put it into the search on Twitter, there's loads of great tips there from writers about overcoming writer's block, which is a course of form of procrastination. And the advice that I gave that writer was write a sentence that is going to appear somewhere in your finished piece we often don't want to do the first thing because we think it's going to be the wrong thing but the first thing is going to be uh, the, the first thing that you do is going to end up being incorporated in what you do anyway so really dial down your expectations of yourself and start somewhere small and manageable thank you Stephen for that question Katie's question about the new job uh, congratulations Katie I hope um, you're celebrating this is fantastic what an amazing time to get a new job um, really impressed by people who are starting new jobs now I think it's incredible uh, my main piece of advice would be to underline what I said earlier about nobody knowing what the hell is going on right now and there being no expert advice right so nobody has ever started a new job during a pandemic before unless you can find maybe can you reach out to other people on LinkedIn or other people in your industry who might have started a new job in the last four to six weeks or ask in your friend group it could be really useful to get uh, uh feedback from other people who've handled this like in the last four to six weeks that would be really really useful see if you can find anyone not even with the same kind of job as you but just the mindset of how people are responding to colleagues in this new time i think to really really dial back on your normal expectations of yourself here would be really useful so you're not going to be able to behave as you would normally in a new job you are probably going to have to take it day by day and feel your way really really carefully and just take your cues from the people around you and ask ask for feedback for like um, you know no one knows how to start a new job in a pandemic let me know what am i doing that's good what am i doing that's bad um and yeah just remember that there's going to be no way of really getting it right so that means there's also no way of getting it wrong from anonymous a uh, really interesting question the one about the mismatch uh, between people at home so the mismatch for anonymous there was you know partners lost their job and is really heartbroken and they need to work and they've got stuff to do and how can they get on with their stuff whilst being sensitive i think this is part of a much broader question of how we all rub along with each other um, in these difficult situations and I see lots of friends who are working on their own at home um, for the first time as well who don't have anyone around them and they're um, having problems of a similar level but with loneliness of like how is reaching out to other people what's too much how can I fight loneliness you know, so this whole business of 
making our lives so enclosed um, is very, very difficult. I think delineation is a really helpful thing here. So make a space and it can, and I mean a space in terms of like a geographical space, which is where you do your work and also a space in terms of a mental space. So make working hours and be um, very strict with yourself. Like this is my working hour time and I go to my space and I do this, but the rest of the time I'm here for you and I'm here to be fun and, and take your mind off things and find new things that we can do together, whether it's, you know, learning how to bake a banana bread is the big thing that everybody's doing. Or, you know, find projects that you can do together that have nothing to do with any of this and that have nothing to do with work. And uh, really use that idea, I think, of delineation and demarcation of some kind, I think would be incredibly helpful. Uh, Sarah's question, I love, a very kind of uh, euphemistic question of how do you have empathy for colleagues who have checked out? Um, how can you deal with grace? I have put, how to have grace when managing the inept? Uh, of course, you know, we're all being very nice and friendly and sweet on, on, this, on this call, aren't we? And um, assuming that everybody wants to, to do their best and work hard and lift as you climb. But of course, you know, as uh, Cuomo was saying in New York uh, last week, you know, these situations bring out the best in people, they bring out the worst in people, but they also bring out what was already there. And if uh, somebody wasn't really that interested in their job and now they get to be at home and have the excuse of like, oh yeah, I'm anxious all the time and I can't do anything, <laughs> then how do you motivate that person and have grace and empathy? I think the fact that you've asked the question indicates that you do have grace and empathy already, Sarah. So I wonder if it's about managing your patience and your resilience and making sure that you don't stray into resentment uh, towards these people. Try and depersonalize it as much as possible so that you're thinking, I need to protect uh, the work, protect the work. So if what they're doing is detrimental to the work, detrimental to the team, uh, is having a, an impact of some kind, then obviously you need to do something to protect that. Um, but try to steer away from, you know, you know, like it's so, in lots of the events that I do, um, people's questions are really about bitching about their nightmare colleagues and their nightmare bosses and that's totally normal um, and it's something that we're all slightly having to gloss over at the moment because if someone was your nightmare colleague and your nightmare boss and you now can only communicate with them on zoom and they are still as inept as they ever were it is kind of horrific and sort of unmanageable so my advice in that situation would always be manage yourself first so try and see the funny side of it if you can try and manage your feelings stay in your own zone control what you can control and providing there's no intensely negative impact on the business in which case maybe seek help from another colleague or a boss or um, someone else in your industry who might be able to give advice as to how to motivate that person or how that person can be sort of managed or controlled or sidelined perhaps in some way until they can come back in when they feel better um, but yeah managing yourself so you're managing your frustration um, could be much more productive than trying to manage that other person uh, Malina, setting boundaries around uh, a mean boss, you know, you've got a boss who's, this is sort of opposite, maybe Sarah is, is Malina's boss, no, not really. Um, yeah, what do you do if you've got the opposite problem, if you've got a boss who's basically saying, like, you're not doing enough, um, not getting results here, um, I need to see more, I need, to, I need you on more Zoom calls, I've got um, a friend who's told me she spent 10 hours in one day uh, on Zoom, I've done a four hour Zoom call. <laughs> These things are really sent to test us. So this is a question about boundaries and this is a very difficult time to set boundaries and I think you just have to be as straightforward about it as you can. So you need to go to that boss and say, I really want to do a good job here but I'm struggling with this workload. What can we do to manage that? And keeping it as open a, a, a question as possible. Um, if you can come with some suggestions of how you might 
do the work in a different way, great. Um, but it's also your boss's job to think about how that might be done in a different way. But go with an open question of how can we manage this workload differently rather than you are making me do this. Uh, how can we question is always much more helpful. Um, Rose, um, my heart goes out to you. Um, you're feeling lost. Things are difficult. How can you establish some personal space? Uh, I would really look to the idea of cultivating community. Who can you talk to who is going to make you feel better? Who out of your friends or your family always makes you laugh? Can you make sure that you have a 15 minute check in with them every day? Can you make sure you have a treat of some kind like some, you know, nearly every day uh, here we're watching SNL Saturday Night Live on YouTube for five, ten minutes, uh, like religiously uh, at various intervals because it's just so uplifting. You find yourself little treats to push yourself through the day. Reach out to the people who understand you, who really make you feel warm and make you feel good about things. Those are the people that pull into your life at the moment. And in terms of work stuff, maybe just you know take a bit of a step back for now until you've built yourself up a bit better as the person that you are with your friends i think that can be incredibly helpful um dana back to you we're coming into the last 10 minutes now okay um from valentina how to learn how to organize our time while working in lockdown mm -hmm. uh sharon asks uh, this week, I have really struggled with homeschooling. I feel a bit burnt out and I'm definitely not a teacher. Any tips on how best manage it? Um, Emily has a similar question asking for tips managing a work-life balance, especially if you have children. Mm -hmm. um, Sarah, asks, Sarah asks, how can one navigate remote work where it's rather impractical to work from home because of a cramped home space? Mm -hmm. Britt asks, I'm currently on the other side of the world from my family. How do I deal with the uncertainty of not being able to fly home in case of losing my job? What's the name of that person? Britt. Britt, okay. So missing family abroad? Missing family abroad and not being able to fly home in case she loses her job. Okay. Well, also probably not able to fly anywhere. Yeah. Anyway. Right, yeah, go on. Um, Anna asks, um, well, I really enjoy your podcast. May you give some tips on how to own the room from home? <laughs> yeah. One more. Uh, Sylvia asks, how do you manage attention span with friends that overwhelm you with typical photos of their children and lives without considering that you are lonely, your situation has changed, and life is not the same as some months ago when you replied constantly? Oh, yeah. Screw those friends, Sylvia. How dare they? Yes. There's a lot of people asking about this at the moment because there's a lot of weird stuff going on on uh, social media of people. I find it pretty extraordinary. <laughs> you know, people posting pictures of like, here is my fabulous home life. Here is my amazing banana bread. Look, I'm having a lovely family dinner. Um, yeah, I think, uh, Sylvia, your question is something that a lot of people are thinking about. So one thing that might... Uh, make you feel better is that a lot of people are really suffering from the same thing and um, it's sort of the opposite of schadenfreude isn't it it's like Freud and Schadenfreude or something it's like I don't want to see all your joy um, that really I think is about setting a boundary for yourself so these people are free to post whatever they want um, and to tell you about whatever they want but you do not have to make your attention available to them uh, we're all in control of our own attention and where we put our time. So if a friend starts uh, being on the phone with you or on a Zoom call with you and they're just going on and on and on and on and making it all about them and how fabulous their life is and they're not asking about you, then do you know what? Um, you think you can smell something burning and you need to go and check something. Or, oh, sorry, I've just remembered I have to be on a work call. You know, you do not have to continue that call. Um, you don't have to confront it either. Like I think people often get the message, um, but you don't have to stay listening to people's stuff and you don't have to go on social media. If you don't want to see that stuff, then block, mute, you know, unfollow. Um, but yeah, manage uh, your own attention. Yeah. Let's go to Valentina. 
and uh, how to organize your time, I'm going to point you in the direction of that idea, idea of um, delineation. And this also goes to Sarah, who was talking about being cramped at home. So this is about finding a way in your mindset of thinking, this time is when I do this thing. This part of the house is where I do this thing. And, you know, believe me, like, I'm too ashamed to, like, show you the mess that I'm currently sitting in. But however small and however cramped your stuff is and however much stuff you have, like, I mean, we have, I've done a, a, a clear out, which means, you know, my house basically looks like one of those hoarding documentaries where there's no route from the front door to the rest of the house because it's all just boxes because obviously we can't take it anywhere. So lots of people are living in um, really tricky space at the moment but it's about trying to find like some small space even if it's just a chair which is where you do your meditation app or when you sit on your bed that is the half hour that you do your emails and you can be very unambitious with these things i think trying to set like a seven hour timetable for yourself where you do this is i think that's crazy but trying to set like, okay, half an hour at this time is when I do my emails. 15 minutes at this time is when I do my meditation app. 10 minutes at this time is when I watch Saturday Night Live on YouTube. Just finding these very small demarcation things, none of which have to be uh, punitive, difficult work things. They can be relaxing things. Just helps you define a very, very small an easy sense of structure. So be unambitious about organizing time and organizing space is, is my top tip. Uh, Sharon, I'm so with you here. Uh, I'm definitely not a teacher. I think I probably could have a t-shirt made with that on. I think my children are probably already having that, uh, that t-shirt made. Um, so many questions about homeschooling at the moment and um, obviously I've got 16 year old whose exams have been cancelled so that's great like he just won't be educated for the foreseeable future. Um, I've started a German film club with him which is where, where I make him watch films in German uh, that's working very well so you know that is a good tip actually is just find anything that seems vaguely educational. Uh, there's a lot of advice about this online, a lot of great tips um, about going to lots of the galleries have got stuff going on. The BBC has got a whole education programme that they've rolled out. So there is stuff off the curriculum that I think can make you feel a bit better. But what I'm hearing from lots of parents is that, of course, they want to follow the curriculum and they want to... Um, enact the work that is being set uh, for children and it's very difficult sometimes to follow the instructions online and totally clueless most of the time um, i think you have to adopt a mindset about this and stick to it and be kind to yourself so you have to think i'm not doing this as brilliantly as i'd like to and maybe i'm really doing it quite badly but that's just going to be how it's going to be I read an article in The Guardian the other day that said that two thirds of children in the UK have not actually done any school work at all. <laughs> so I think if you've tried to do something, it's a good thing. Um, and I've heard lots of teachers saying, you know, if, uh, and actually a friend of mine who's a policewoman said, you know, if a whole cohort of children don't learn how to do fractions for six months, what difference is it going to make? Um, ultimately, it's not going to make a massive difference. Um, please don't focus on it. somebody's going to put this like on an education website but I just think people are putting themselves under too much pressure about this at the moment so again start small do small achievable things and don't make it a battleground because making school work and education a battleground is is the worst long-term thing that any of us can do okay heavy um to uh, uh, managing work-life balance uh, with small children for Emily, um, you can't, you cannot manage work-life balance with small children. Uh, I do see a lot of uh, women struggling with this at the moment, in particular, if there's a bit of a mismatch um, in parenting duties, I'm, I'm saying this very euphemistically, um, you have to learn not to be the primary parent. Uh, if there are two parents in the house you have to learn 
to cede authority to the other parent whenever you can and give up some of that space um, and create little pockets for yourself. I really feel as if there are a lot of parents who are not making that much time for themselves at the moment. Um, it is not a crime to leave your child in front of a screen for a short amount of time. It's not a crime to leave them alone with some coloring or, you know, with some pots and pans. I mean, whatever it takes to find some pockets of sanity for yourself. Please don't imagine that other people are acing this in some kind of work-life balance kind of way because, you know, I've worked freelance from home for 20 years. I have three children. I couldn't manage it without childcare. I, obviously, I don't have any childcare at the moment. Um, so it, I think it's a bit of a joke to try and manage work-life balance at the moment. So muddling through however best you can. Um, whilst not being afraid to be selfish sometimes, I think is really, really important. Britt, I'm so sorry that you can't fly home. Um, I think the way to think about this is looking at the bigger picture because, yeah, it's really painful to be missing people and wanting to be with family. Um, but the picture is so unclear. You know, at the moment, if you fly out of the UK, when you come back, you're going to have to take a two week quarantine. Um, I think looking at the bigger picture is going to make maybe make you feel better like it's almost it's not impossible to do this but it's very hard and losing your job is almost the worst the least of it so find ways of checking in with your family in ways that make you feel better in the short term and hope that you know in the weeks to come that this is a short-term thing and don't be thinking too far into the future and thinking oh I don't know when I'm gonna you know we don't know lots of things at the moment which means that anything could change at any moment so be hopeful and find ways of coping in the short term if that makes you feel sick and you're thinking Viv I hate you this is terrible advice and I have to go and maybe it means me losing my job then you know what your answer is Anna how to own the room from home and Sylvia, um, oh, Sylvia, I already answered about their horrible friends who were pushing their banana bread in your face. So yeah, let's close off on um, Anna, how to own the room from home. Well, this is partly how to own the Zoom. And I'm hoping that I've modeled a little bit of how to own the Zoom uh, from home. So one thing I've been doing throughout this whole thing, and anyone who listens to the podcast, How to Own the Room will know that I love a practical tip. I hope you've noticed that a lot of the time I have tried to talk to you uh, by looking in your face, <laughs> looking at in your screen, which means uh, it's weird for me because I'm looking at like the little pinhole camera that is at the top of the screen. I'm not looking here. Can you see the difference if I talk to you here? If I talk to you here, I'm looking at myself in the screen. If I talk to you here, then I'm talking to you through the camera. And I feel that talking, having the discipline to force yourself to talk to people through the camera, however weird it is, and for some people it means actually putting up um, a paper on the screen so they won't be tempted to look at themselves or look at the other people on the screen, but forcing yourself to look at the camera and listen to people is actually more effective than getting distracted by all of the visual cues and by thinking, oh, are my earrings jiggling too much? What is this piece of my hair doing? Like, other people don't care about that. All they want to do is understand what you're saying and be able to focus on you and to kind of feel you. And the only way you can get that is by looking directly into that camera. So hopefully that gives you a little flavor of how to own the room. Let me finish uh, before we just hand back to Dana to hand off to say, please do grab a copy of the book. Uh, if you already have it, then please do buy one for someone else. You can also get it on Audible and on Kindle. This is how to own the room. Because my message is about lift as you climb and it's about promoting others. Uh, this is a great time to promote others. So I really want to promote this as my favorite book of the moment. Julia Samuel, This Too Shall Pass. She's a psychotherapist and this is a brilliant book about loss and all its different definitions. It's really uplifting, really moving, beautifully written. And so she is somebody I would really love to lift at the moment. But most of all, I want to say thank you so much to all of you uh, for tuning in. And uh, as part of my whole thing of like treating yourself and having good moments, I have bought myself a bottle of my favorite wine um, to have afterwards um, which I'm going to drink uh, with a huge toast to all of you so thank you
Thank you so much, Viv. Um, I'm just going to put this slide up so everyone can see. Um, thank you all so much for attending. Thank you, Viv, again so much for such useful information. Um, we'll be sending a replay video of the talk within 24 hours, along with the links to buy Viv's book, Lift As You Climb. Um, thank you once again, everyone, for being here, and we hope to see you at another one of our live streams. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dana.